everyone welcome back we have a really cool show for you today there's been so many times where we've talked about ptsd trauma stress it comes up in almost every conversation because it's related to all of what we deal with when it comes to your body your health uh, your mood etc and we've spoken in terms of root cause like why at the genetic level do these things happen we now have someone joining us and, I, and i've often used the example of the work that we did with the U.S. military and and Navy SEALs, who I never got to meet, we just did the work through some conduit, and there was no connection. But guess what? There's a Navy SEAL joining us here today, Christopher Meher, who has just put out a book about the topic and is going to give us the other side of the story. So thank you for joining us here today. Oh, thank you for that intro. I'm happy to be here. I'm glad you guys have done your research. When it comes to trauma, PTSD, anything we're trying to heal, whether it's Lyme disease whether it's breast cancer, it doesn't matter. If you haven't first fixed this up here, it's very difficult to deal with whatever that chronic condition is or your energy level or your sleep or whatever, because your perception drives your reality yeah. and it's hard to let go of things sometimes. So, and you're, you've been able to do the reverse. You've been able to change your reality by altering your perception. It's just really cool. It's a power that, you know, the only way you were able to survive what you've gone through. So tell us a little bit about your thinking around you know, all of what we're going to cover today, starting with this like fight or flight response, because that's you in a nutshell, you've been thrown into <laughs> crazy situations that none of us could even dream of. How do you actually wrangle that in and cope with something that intense? I had a lot of childhood trauma. And because that was delivered to me when I was very young, like three and a half years old, first going into SEAL training, going into SEAL teams, it felt normal to me. Right, because mm. my nervous system was already in a hyper state of vigilance. Wow. So that's uh, yeah, that's a consideration that you would never even think of. Like you were wired epigenically. Yeah. Let's say the habits that were yeah. surrounding you were you were already designed yeah. by more nurture. And then than I nature. went to a boarding yeah. school, and in boarding school, there's 16 boys in in each student home. In a SEAL team platoon, there's 16 guys. Right. In my boarding school, there was four oh, wow. officers. In a SEAL team platoon, there's four officers. Even the hierarchy was the same. The only difference was my trauma when I was younger was all around fire. I had a, a babysitter named Mrs. Baskerfield decide that the best way to teach me to not play with matches was to put my hands on the gas stove, which obviously is not the best way to Whoa. teach a child. And she was having a break from reality. So SEAL training was the opposite of that. It was cold. Right, because they're they're dipping you in mm, water yeah. that's somewhere between maybe fifty three and fifty eight degrees. But the problem is you're in there for a long time, right? And water has twenty five times the cooling effect of air, so that means you get colder twenty five times right. faster. So if you were to stand outside naked and it was fifty four degrees, your core temperature is going to drop twenty five times slower than if you were in cold water. Yeah. That that was a lot to deal with. My mind doesn't have any control over that. So what did you actually realize? Like growing in it and, you know, myself growing up in poverty, it's just normal until you realize that you're out of it. And like, wow, I can't believe that's how I live. Was there a point where you came to this realization? Like that was not right. Because I was so young and it became, so think about this. When you have, when you have a child there from birth, to seven, they're in a precognitive state of function, right? So that means they, they don't understand context. Mm -hmm. So what I was making up about that dynamic and that situation, I don't remember. Your conscious mind does not have access, direct access to your subconscious stressors, traumas, or traumas. I can look at it now and go, hey, that was terrible. And then when I consider the alternative, she being at work, me not being looked after, and then me burning the house down to the ground, I think, okay, maybe having my hands burned wasn't such a bad idea. Wow. <laughs> and do you think without that happening, you would have never became a SEAL? Uh, I definitely would have had no interest. I was not the guy that woke up, patriotism, all right, I'm yeah. an American. <laughs> <laughs> no, that wasn't me. But once yeah. I, I got access to a biannual magazine, on the front cover, mm -hmm. it had eight eight boat crews with telephone poles, right? So seven guys with a telephone pole over the shoulder running down the beach, right? And as soon as I saw that image, I thought, mm -hmm. yeah, that's what I need. I need somebody who's going to challenge me. 
And in terms of challenge, mm. that's exactly what I needed. You know, someone who was not going to let me off the hook. They can't be charmed by my charming personality. They don't care about my curated image, right? They're going to get in my face and they're going to require me to show up every single day. That was perfect for me because I believe that every young man needs a rite of passage. Okay. That was probably yeah. a little intense for the rite of passage, but I do believe that there's purpose and value in that. The challenge for the military is this. They don't understand that the stress and the trauma that they're putting in these guys' bodies is going to alter the way that they perceive reality after they leave the military is going to leave them with a very limited way of functioning and perceiving and experiencing and emoting, right? Because, you know, when you're in the military, stoicism is your best friend. You're not going to show the instructor like, ah, I have this blister on the bottom of my foot and it hurts. The instructor's going to look at you like, and so you mm. have a blister on the bottom of your foot and it hurts. So what? Keep moving. Yeah. Keep because, going. you know, yeah. the, the ravages of war do not care if men are uncomfortable. They don't care if men are in pain. They don't care if men are fractured emotionally. What they care about is, are you going to live or are you going to die? It's a, the stark contrast of growing up in your parents' home and your mom doing your laundry and she giving you a hug and a kiss when you come home or before you go to school is very different than war, right? It's very different than being in the SEAL teams and going through SEAL training because they're there to prepare you to perform at the highest level regardless of the the amount of stress that's coming at you. And that's the thing, you know, SEAL yeah. training is designed to get you to be present when it really sucks. And what better tool could they use than intense exercise and really cold water and very loud noises? Yeah, pushing you to the extreme. You're, so now here you are, you're one of these few people that have been through this. And not only did you learn how to operate in those extremes and succeed, but you also then learn this next phase. And this is where the huge value is in everybody listening today. The extremes that you went through and the ability to learn, cope, move on and sort of normalize and be able to speak to it at this level to understand it versus the things that happen in everyday life that are causing people trauma, stress, anxiety, depression. The coping skills or the understanding that you've developed if we can apply that to everyday problems, we will all thrive. And that's why we're here today to listen to you. So what did you do? What are all these, this resilience that you built? So give us some sort of tactics on how you got to the sort of Zen state after coming yeah, where you came uh, from. Pain. Pain was the driver. After I got out of the SEAL teams, my next interest was qualifying for the Olympic trials, right? A few years into that experience, the whole left side of my body was full of pain and they were overuse injuries, right? So I was getting a lot of iliotibial band friction syndrome, Achilles tendonitis, runner's knee, hip pain, low back stiffness, restriction with turning my head to the left, leaning my head to the left, frozen shoulder syndrome. Then I had these growths that were showing up on my left wrist. I mean, the whole left side of me was in constant discomfort. And then I got in a car accident. After that, the pain went directly into the center of my hip, and it felt like there was an ice pick, you know, every two or three seconds. Whoosh, whoosh. And no matter what I did, hopping, jumping, skipping, running, laying down, sitting down, I could never get away from the discomfort. And that caused me to shift out of that stoic mode and that lone wolf mode and bend the knee. And when I say bend the knee, I mean reach out for help and pull someone else into my inner story of what was going on. Because if you saw me walking down the street or at the gym or on a run or at a health food store, you know, the way that I presented myself was good, right? I, I was kind, I was well-spoken, I was considerate. But what you didn't know is underneath that Adonis-looking body was a body that was full of discomfort and pain. Right? And I could be talking to you, smiling and laughing while my hip is still going. Vroosh, vroosh, vroosh. So I learned to mask the discomfort 
And I think the challenge, anyone who is in an intense trauma state and they have to put on a good face, once you put on that good face and you have success at fooling everyone, you're going to continue to keep doing it because the reward is you get to be in your pain by yourself. And that's a challenge because it leaves you alone. If you can't reach out and tell your brother, like I didn't even tell my brother I was in that much discomfort, and you're not telling your mom, you're suffering alone, right? But when you've been in all kinds of pain, it doesn't feel like you're suffering alone. It's just in retrospect, you realize that that's what you were doing, right? When I was in it, I thought yeah. I was just being a man and I was sucking it up because, you know, the boarding school that I went to in Hershey, Pennsylvania, at St. Milton Hershey School, you weren't allowed to bitch, whine, moan, or complain because if you did, you got more chores, right? You got more punishment. You weren't allowed to speak out against what was happening if it wasn't working for you. And in the SEAL teams and SEAL training, there definitely is no bitching, moaning, whining, or complaining because you can't be in the field, right, on an op and somebody's complaining about, you know, their ingrown toenail. They're just like, pull out a knife, pull out something, cut that thing out and be quiet and let's keep moving. Okay. There's no time for that. And what happened for me is I reached out to someone who came to my aid, right? They brought a yoga mat to my house and a juicer. And during that experience, I realized very quickly that they were healthy and fit and I was fit and toxic and they could get in every yogic position and I couldn't get into any of them. After that session was over, they suggested that I go look into structural integration, a system called Rolfing. So I spent some time researching and trying to find the right person for me. And fortunate enough for me, I found a guy named Stephen Bolger who was doing this work called Heller Work. And I got into Heller Work and I started to get some relief. And I was very happy for the little reprieve that I had from the discomfort. But eventually it started to creep back in, right? And what I needed is I needed tools that generated more leverage. And so I started using eccentric contractions to pull the intense amount of stress and tension out of my body. And then once that started to reduce, I started shifting out of that SEAL team mindset into a SAGE mindset. And I spent five to six hours a day opening up my body and reducing that stress and tension. And it changed the way that I perceive, it changed the way that I breathe, it changed the way that I moved, it my penmanship changed. Like literally everything changed, the way that I slept, the direction that I slept, the types of foods that I was attracted to. The more I reduced the tension and stress, the more I was attracted to healthier things, right? So relationships that didn't work for me, guys that wanted to go out and hit the sauce and and get wild. I was no longer interested in that. I was interested in being around people who were focused on getting healthy from the inside out, top to bottom, back to front, in to out. And I immersed myself in that lifestyle and I changed everything about how I was operating. Yeah, that your story it reminds me of so many, call it self-heal functional medicine type stories where it starts with conventional, call it health or medicine, there's an identity to the problems. You believe it's innate. I have this thing, right? I have pain. It's part of my life. And, and the, the problem with that is that's supported medically. You're diagnosed to have something, and here's the treatment that you probably will be on for most of your life. And so there's this label or identity that, and this is me sort of interpreting what I just heard, because it's, it's so important for people to get this and apply it to their context which is remove the identity, believe that self-care is an important tool, right? And what does that mean for you? It depends on what your problem is. What are, you, what are you trying to solve? Find those tools. They are available, right? Start looking for the root cause tools and change your identity. Become a different version of yourself. And also don't expect that to happen with the flip of a switch. It happens with slow adopting. The journey you described is the ideal way to do it. You don't do everything at once because you're going to collapse on your face. You slowly build up. It's like, I don't go to the gym and try and bench press 400 pounds my first day. I, I grab the bar and I start. 
and then I keep developing and developing, developing. So some of the things you mentioned, just for your own personal story. So I'm familiar with rolfing. I tried it once. It is extremely painful. It's this deep, you know, separating membranes from muscle and deep, deep, like trauma releasing type massage. The eccentric movement you described, what is that? I am not familiar. I did 60 sessions of structural integration work, right? Oh, I did too. Yeah. And I gave up. Yeah. So <laughs> for anyone listening, yes, there's a lot of discomfort and you're going to have to learn how to breathe. With the eccentric contraction, so when you look at the body, there's three types of contractions, or what really there's one type of contraction, but they break them down into three. You have concentric, which is to build strength. You have isometric, which is to recruit more tissue. Okay. And you have eccentric, which is to, to remove tension. Okay. So when a muscle's contracting maximally and lengthening simultaneously, that's the removal of tension. When a muscle is contracting maximally and shortening, that's the building of strength. When the muscle is contracting maximally and not moving, that's the recruitment of new tissue. Okay, so basically what I did is I figured out how to strengthen, recruit new tissue, now stretch that new tissue, and now strengthen that new tissue, recruit new tissue, stretch that new tissue, strengthen that new tissue again and again and again and again and again and again all in every single imaginable position and over mm. time what happened is my body got really supple right but at the same time it got really strong strong in ways that i couldn't imagine because now all the bones in my body were in a more ideal position i could handle an intense amount of stress on my body but before, because I was going through SEAL training, I was only putting tension in, right? So tension and stress in, tension and stress in, tension and stress in. My body was relying on cortisol and adrenaline, right? And once your body's living off cortisol and adrenaline, your adrenal glands, they're forced to get bigger. But now because your adrenal glands are bigger, you're looking for situations outside of you to ignite the release of more adrenaline. So now, even though I was out of the SEAL teams, I was manufacturing ways in order to keep myself stressed. So basically, you know, I might start packing my bags 10 minutes before I'm meant to leave for the airport rather than packing them the night before, right? And I've got to rush around, grab yeah. this, grab this. I get down in my car. I'm like, oh, no, I forgot that. I have to run back up. Then I'm in the taxi. I'm putting a lot of pressure on the taxi driver to drive faster. Like everything was like super, super, super intense. So even though I didn't have SEAL training and SEAL teams to apply those stressors to me, I was using my external life to manufacture the production of adrenaline and cortisol at the same level that I had it when I was in SEAL training in the SEAL teams. You just cracked the code on something that I've been working on. There's, you know, We work with a lot of executives on their overall health journey, and we see what we call this A-type personality. We understand that for some people, they have a not so good relationship with dopamine, so it's harder for them to experience pleasure and reward. They may genetically clear their neurochemicals a little faster, and so it's harder for them to stay in pleasure and reward, and so they take on more stress. The physiological part of that we haven't considered yet, which is that by taking on more, they actually train their body, just like you train a muscle or your brain or your lungs, they train their adrenals to be in that state, which then means, like you said, constant adrenal drip, You, your your body's like, where's the stress? I'm designed That's for right. stress, literally at the yep. physiological level, which is incredible, mind-blowing. I never thought of it that way. But when you say it, it's so... I've seen it in myself, yeah. by the way, I'm trying to heal that, but I've seen it myself. So yeah. that's crazy. And, you know, fortunate for me, I've had some very good partners who pulled me aside and, uh, and said, look, you know, we're getting ready to go to the airport. Have you noticed you get into this state? I was like, what? I didn't even yeah. notice it at first, right? I was like, what are you talking about this state? Like you're in the SEAL teams and honey, we're just going to the airport. And I was like, yeah. oh, okay. So then initially I was a little offended, right? So then I'm like, okay, I'm going to track this. So we get in the car, we're driving to the airport. And she's like, can't you feel all this intense energy coming off of your body? And I was like, oh, oh, 
oh, I am in that state. Okay. And then yeah. once you're in that state, once you release hormones into the bloodstream, they have a, how I would say this, um, they run for a certain amount of time, right? Until they burn off. Mm -hmm. And once she continued to help me identify that state, I got to start tracking this. And then I'd realize I would be locked into that state for maybe three and a half to four to five hours. And there was no thinking your way out of it. There's no breathing your way out of it. Those hormones are already released in the bloodstream and they're time sensitive because they release more stress markers. And the more stress markers you have in your blood, yeah. the more your, your adrenal glands are told to release the hounds, bring more adrenaline, <laughs> okay? And as I yeah. continue to reduce more tension and more stress in my body, guess what happened? That initial burst got smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller mm -hmm. to the point where I remember I was driving from West Hollywood to Marina Del Rey and I wasn't paying attention. I was dilly dallying with my phone and I look up and this car had pulled out in front of me and I slammed on my brakes and my heart rate didn't go up. And every other time I was in a situation wow. like that, my heart rate, of course, bu -bu 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 it went to go up. I felt yeah. my heart went like this. It went, then it was a pause and it went right back down. And then I was like, I'm finally free. So you literally eliminated the stress response. So for people that are listening, where do they start? How do you they know, get there? The, the first thing, you have to learn how to do best exercise, right? I call best exercise the best form of exercise because you're using isometric, eccentric, and concentric contraction, right? In its very specific way. BEST stands for bioenergetic self-transformational sequences. And so I have one for every organ, every muscle in the body. There's a different position and a way of utilizing those three types of contractions to reduce that stress load. The other thing you can do is you can find an alpha biotics practitioner who will use a technique called the alignment that was created by Dr. Michael Crane's family. And it will pull you out of an inappropriate stress state. And if you continue to get that alignment, you know, once a week, at a minimum, once every two weeks, eventually what's going to happen is your brain's going to stay in a state of, um, whole brain thinking versus a lateralized state of function. When you're in an inappropriate stress state, you're, you're locked into fight or flight, freeze or fawn. And you got to be able to identify right. other people's states because when someone's fawning you, you don't know the reason why they're doing that is because they feel unsafe, right? And so mm -hmm. once a person realizes that the way that they're moving through the world is limiting, and the outcomes that they're receiving from this limited experience are unsatisfactory um, and upsetting or frustrating or agitating, you need to find somebody who will help you reduce your stress load, meaning you got to go into the body. Why? Because the body's the subconscious, okay? And your body has all of the imprints of every experience that you've ever been through. It's sitting right there. The brain, which is your governing vessel, it stores every particular type of stress in a different part of your body because every part of your body has a different level of consciousness. And the brain's job is to manage that, right? The challenge is, is that when the brain's, because its job is to figure out what's funky and not working correctly, it doesn't know when it's damaged because its job is to register damage. Right. So then you got to go in the body and find where there's pain and wherever there's pain, that's your indicator that guess what? You're in fight or flight in that part of your body. Remove that discomfort, remove that pain. And then what happens is that aspect of the brain that's correlated to that part of the body now comes back online. Once an aspect of your brain goes offline, 
that part of your body goes offline too. That's powerful. So, so far, you know, when anyone I've spoken to about, uh, call it stress or trauma response, yes, there's some discussion about holding on to things in your muscle, very high level, you know, without getting into detail of the actual mechanism that you're describing. And, but the solutions are usually around the mind itself, you know, meditate, breathe, etc. Because we feel it in our, we think stress is a response of the mind. Uh, which yes, the mind is reacting to the response of the body, That's right. right? And and how you hold it and where you feel it, uh, and and this is where people lose it. And it's it's not. And this is why food, exercise, all of it counts because if the body is not in the right state, you don't cope with the stress, which we are designed to cope with, right? We have the right, uh, call it hormones, chemicals, all this stuff to to deal with whatever gets thrown at us. But in our current reality, and our current choices we are misaligned with that when there's somebody has so call it like an acute response like what you're talking about is months of unraveling something right but you're now getting to call it the promised land where you can now manage this thing and you've you've reversed you've removed everything from your physical body how someone who's not there yet and they're they're stuck and they say, okay, I'll do this. I'm going to get there. But what can they do to manage that acute, like today? That today, problem? Problem. well, you, here's the good thing about the body is it, you have four different stages of consciousness, right? So you've got your mental body, which is your conscious mind. It uses thought as its highway to freedom, okay? And of course, you can drop into meditation and you can use your analysis to attempt to understand what's going on around you. So take a half step back, make sure it's not personal. That's one way. But the easiest way is to go into the unconscious. And the unconscious controls the breath. You have what are called the four absolutes, or what I call the four absolutes. And every moment you're in, you have to be breathing, thinking, circulating energy, moving, or in a position, right? So what does that mean? Physical, mental, emotional, spiritual. If you shut one of these off, the chances that you're going to live are very slim. Now that we know that the breath runs the unconscious, what would you do in a situation where you start to find your fears are increasing, right? Your fear state's getting higher, or your anxiety's getting higher, or your mind is running faster, or you're feeling really depleted in your energy, or you're starting to feel some pain or some discomfort, right? What would be the prudent thing to do? Simple. Take a breath and breathe relative to your true level of discomfort. So let's say my anxiety is an 8 out of 10. I need to find a quiet space around from other people, and I need to breathe an 8 out of 10. What does an 8 out of 10 look like? If my anxiety levels at a 5 out of 10, or the speed of my mind is at 50 out of 100, what am I going to do? And I'm going to breathe at that rate and that depth until I feel my anxiety reduce, the pace and rate of my thoughts reduce, my stress reduce and my discomfort reduce okay and you can always interfere because if you don't interfere you're reinforcing the state right because the body is trying to get your attention yeah. it's like hey yo jake listen up buddy you're stressed this moment is bigger than you've been prepared for let's tune in take some deep breaths and relax and as soon as you meet the stress level with the true level of breath, right? So let's say this excessive level of sensation is met exactly with the true level of breath. You know what happens at an excessive level of sensation? It drops immediately. Because what your body is looking for, it's looking for you, one, to pay attention, and two, to be met emotionally. Men have been taught to avoid the feelings of emotions and excessive sensations. So we just keep ourselves in a state of hyperactivity. Because if we got to that state mm -hmm. of hyperactivity, we'd have to feel those feelings of upset that we have 
when our wife or our partner emasculates us in front of our friends or our family members, right? And if I have to feel that yeah. state, then I have to feel that level of rejection, that level of upset. And men have been taught to be stoic and not feel those things because men's brains are seven times more sensitive, right? So when you look at a man, you got to understand out of every million people who commit suicide, 876,000 of them are men. Now, mm. come on. I mean, you know, that means that our emotional bodies are seven times more sensitive, but why are they so, why are they much more sensitive? Because men have been taught to hold their breaths when they're stressed. And women have been taught to breathe when they're stressed. Okay? What does a woman do? She immediately yeah. goes in. <laughs> right? She's breathing. What does a man do? Mm -hmm. He cuts off his breath. When you cut off your yeah, cuts off in. his breath, and guess what happens? Your anxiety level gets higher. So now he goes into a state of hyperactivity. Okay? I'm gonna go to the garage, I'm gonna work on this. I'm going to get in the back. I'm going to rake some leaves or, you know, he distracts himself. I'm going to grab my Nintendo and start playing this game. I'm not going to sit in the moment. So if you're a man or a woman, you know, listening right now, the moment you feel your anxiety go from a one to a three, you need to take a quick time out. If you're in a public area, go to the bathroom, sit on the pot. And just sit in it and breathe for a few minutes. And you're going to feel an immediate drop and change to your base state. Mm -hmm. And now that means whenever I'm in a situation that's bigger than I've prepared myself for at an emotional level, I have a way of integrating myself emotionally. And I have a way of breaking the pattern. If you don't have a pattern interrupt, your coping strategy is only going to continue to reinforce this stressor to stay alive and bring you an intense amount of hell in a moment where you want to experience peace. I think the one thing you said in there as a sort of a tool for people to take away, first of all, that was amazing and paints the picture truly of what we can do. That word you used interference because that's a very empowering word for a couple of reasons. First of all, just the biology of it, understanding that you can actually stop this reaction, right? Understanding that it's not something you have to go through and wait for it to be over. You can choose to act against it, right? And block it. But why is it so empowering? Because you are above this thing that's happening to you, right? You There's things that you can pull out of the toolkit that are above this thing, and it truly is in your control. It's not a question of this is happening to me. No, this is happening. And now me, I am going to do something. I'm going to interfere. I'm going to break it. I'm going to stop it. You know, there's there's something coming towards me. I'm going to put up a roadblock and it can't get here. Right. So that interference word to me is so key. And if you think about it that way, it arms you with the to do exactly that. Go interfere with it. Right. And block it. And and breathing works as, as as sort of recreational or simplistic as it seems. We don't do it, and that's why we don't we don't know that it works because you don't do it. And I've done exactly what you described, you know, the the block and progress and get active and the fight response, which is what we are culturally sort of wired for. So, anyways, this is, yeah, that all brilliant, and the people should practice it immediately. This is where ancient cultures tell people pray three four five times a day stop stop your day go in a room and pray and breathe it doesn't matter what you're doing your day is going to be better your body is going to be better your mind's going to be better if you want to keep diving deeper with your prescription for life with the unpilled podcast make sure to subscribe on apple Podcasts, spotify and youtube i've also written my first book the dna way unlock the secrets of your genes to reverse disease slow aging and achieve optimal wellness it's now available for pre-sale on Amazon. Take a look and enjoy, guys. See you next time. When you interrupt the patterns, right? Because the challenge is, is that we get stuck. And the reason why we get stuck is because guess what? Work begins every Monday at 9 o'clock, right? So now, so now your body's on a pattern, okay? Oh, I go to sleep at 11 o'clock. 
That's your pattern. Uh, I eat lunch at two o'clock. That's your pattern. And so your heart and your body, they get used to these rhythms, right? But at some point, the rhythm creates too much stress for you because the sleep that you have is ineffectual, right? It's not satisfactory enough. And your lifetime accumulated stress keeps getting higher. And as your lifetime accumulated stress load gets higher, your restore, repair, recovery rate, it gets lower. And so when a person's having that anxiety or that fear response, or they're in a self-righteous state of function, right? They're judging and criticizing those around them. Or they've got a lot of discomfort in their body. What their body's attempting to inform them is that the patterns that they have, the way their life is structured is incorrect for them. So they have to interfere with that pattern, but they need to understand why the pattern's there in the first place. And this is where I want to talk about lifetime accumulated stress loads. If you as a child grew up in an environment that was stressful for you, you've developed very specific strategies to manage that stress. The challenge is the strategies that adults chose when they were children were irrational. And what I mean by that is every child that's in a precognitive state of function, they don't understand reality because they don't understand context. So the thing for me that I want the listeners to understand is how this all begins. Like it's one thing to be in the stress response, but if you don't know where the root of it comes from, then you're only going to end up back at the same crossroad and you're going to continue to turn left because left is what's familiar. So what you have, every human has, is lifetime accumulated stress. So your lifetime accumulated stress is made up of your genetics, your epigenetics, your environment, and all of your unresolved daily accumulated stress from the moment you were born until today, right? So that load, when it's high, okay, what happens is it pushes down your restore, repair, and recovery rate. So instead of needing six hours to feel amazing, you now need eight. And then a decade later, you need eight and a half. And then a decade later, you need nine and a half to feel normal. So as you reduce that lifetime accumulated stress load, your restore, repair, and recovery rate increases, and then you need less sleep. You need less food. Your body's operating at a high level because it's rested and it's recovered. So when your lifetime accumulated stress load is high, your access to anxiety is very high. Your access to fear is very high. Your access to self-righteousness and physical discomfort and physiological dysfunction is super, super high. When your lifetime accumulated stress load is super, super low, you have next to zero access to those states. You can manage your symptom, right? Your symptom is what you're experiencing because of your daily accumulated stress, all the stress you experience in a 24-hour period, right? If it doesn't get resolved, guess what happens? Monday's stress load ends up in Thursday, right? Thursday's stress load ends up in next Saturday, and you keep piling it on. And now the symptom that you're having, instead of having a headache once every six months, now you have a headache once every three months. Decade later, you have a headache once a week. Decade later, you have two or three headaches a week, right? And it starts compounding. It gets exponential, right, this response. And so what you were sharing earlier about certain cultures and religions that take the time to stop and pray five times a day, when you're engaged in any level of spiritual practice, it causes you to take a half step back and interfere with that pattern. So let's say the Muslims pray five times a day, right? And they have a specific time when, when they do that. That's what's worked for their culture. That's what they've been aware of from, from their research to do. But now we live in a very different world, right? Where the stressors are much more complex. And because we have more complex stress, we've got to be able to deal with the stress load 
in the moment when it reveals itself. I can't wait till 12 o'clock to pray. I'm feeling overwhelmed right now. I'm going to drop down in prayer, meditation, or breath, and it might be 10-10. Because we get to transformation, right? Personal growth is no longer a year-by-year thing or a month-by-month or week-by-week. It's shifted from day-to-day to minute-to-minute. So the moment that anyone is aware, right, that their anxiety is increasing or their fear is increasing or their self-righteousness is increasing, you have to take a half step back and create a pattern interrupt. What we were talking about earlier, because the lifetime accumulated stress loads are so high in the average human, that little interference that you're doing, it will help you deal with the daily but it will never address the lifetime accumulated stress. This is where you need bigger levers, right? You need more leverage in order to reduce that lifetime accumulated stress load. Once you reduce that, the daily accumulated stress load is always super low. That's incredible because first of all, I never thought about stress in the context of accumulation. You think of it as periodic and siloed and one has nothing to do with the other. I got stressed because of something, a lawyer, a lawyer letter, you know, a fight and this concept of things piling on it. It's toxic, just like any other toxin and toxins, whether they're chemicals, pollutants, plastics that are entering it, they do accumulate and they build up and there's a third certain threshold your body can cope with and you get to that point and then all of a sudden you're sick. And I think just like you said, a a certain baseline level of stress you actually need, you know, that's what drives us forward as humans and makes us want to do great things is that stressor and the desire and the hunger and all these things. But like you said, our reality is way beyond that. We are not wired for today's reality. So yeah, this it think rethinking it, understanding that there's a meter that you can feel that's probably telling you the truth about how much you've accumulated. You need to bring that meter back down. And there's a certain level you can cope with. You're probably beyond that. And that's a beautiful way to put it. That's amazing. So so now this is your own healing journey. Is this was this self-taught or where did this even come from, this knowledge? Yeah, yeah. This is yeah, this is all self-taught. This is me figuring out what's going on because I, at one point, when I started experiencing pain, I remember thinking to myself, well, there was a point when I didn't have pain. So this doesn't make any sense. Okay. If I was born and I felt this all the time, okay, I can accept that. But I couldn't accept the pain that I was in. And I knew there was simply something that I didn't know or understand. And so I started looking under every rock, every pebble, every fallen tree in the woods, in the forest, to be able to find solutions and answers. And so I kept hiring different practitioners to work with me, and I would see how effective what they were doing was. And I would dive straight in, okay, right into the deep end. Let's do this thing again and again and again and again, and let's see what the return on investment is. And from what I understood at the time, the return on investment was very, very low. Okay. I just, I knew that there was a way to create instantaneous permanent change. And I kept looking and looking and looking. And I found it and I figured it out. And I put a system together that has created what I call an implicate order to true transformation. And there's a very specific way to go about it to produce a verifiable, repeatable, predictable outcome, which is the resolution of that stress load. Because there's basically, there's four lanes, right? There's stress ignorance, which is where most humans live, okay? There's negative stress management, there's positive stress management, and there's stress resolution. Negative stress management and positive stress management, they're only dealing with the daily accumulated stress because they don't have enough power leverage to deal with the lifetime accumulated stress load. If you want to get into stress resolution, you have to use systems that address your lifetime accumulated stress load. So let's talk about some positive stress management tools. We did early meditation, breath work, exercise, 
napping, clear communication, juggling. You know, there's a myriad of, of tools that you can access for positive stress management. Then there's negative stress management tools, which is where most humans are, right? There's nicotine, there's caffeine, there's alcohol, there's refined brown and white sugar, there's pharmaceutical drugs, there's recreational drugs, there's food colorings, there's, there's preservatives, right? There's uh, pornography, there's promiscuity, there is um, dishonesty, right? There's all of these negative stress management tools that people are using to attempt to feel normal. That's the only reason why they're using it, because they at least give them a slight reprieve from that overwhelming state of an anxiety and fear that they constantly live under. And that's, and that's, yeah, that's a big difference between a tool or a coping mechanism. A coping mechanism just allows you to handle where you're at. A tool allows you to fix it, which is all what you're talking about. Yeah. And so when we get into stress resolution, right, that's the lane where you go, okay, I no longer, I, I want to break my addiction to negative stress mm -hmm. management tools. Okay. And the way you do that is by removing a severe amount of accumulated stress and tension. Because the, the stress manifests as tension. Tension creates distortion. We say distortion, what do we mean? We mean structural distortion. Literally, the bones rotated in the wrong directions. When that happens, it changes the baseline frequency, mm. right? And when it changes the baseline frequency, you're now magnetically orientated to attract negative experiences, negative people, and negative energy into your life. When we rotate the bones back into the opposite direction, you now are aligned to learn through positive benefit, mm -hmm. right? So people can either learn through negative benefit or they can learn through positive benefit. When your bones are malaligned, you are hired and required to learn through negative benefit. When your bones are pulled out of that distorted state of function and in supreme alignment, you are now hired and required to learn through positive benefit. So now you get to shift out of struggle and strife into ease and grace. When you're struggling and strife, guess what? Your mind is constantly active. Your emotions are ungrounded. You have a high state of anxiety. You've got physiological dysfunction, or you have structural pain at any one of your joints, or you're spiritually sick. So when I say you're spiritually sick, you're unable to honor your ethics, morals, values, and principles that you were taught to your own benefit. Mm -hmm. And so let me go over this again. So you've got stress that's unresolved, that manifests this tension, that then creates distortion. Psychological distortion, emotional distortion, physiological distortion, or energetic distortion. When you're distorted, you're in pain. Mm -hmm. And pain is your friend if you know what to do with it. Every bit of pain that anyone has in their life, whether it's suppression, whether it's depression, whether it's a headache, whether it's excessive menstrual cramps, whether it's a stiff back, uh, whether it's insomnia, use that pain to guide you into people that will help you resolve the pain because in the process of resolving the pain, you reduce your lifetime accumulated stress. Mm -hmm. And now your restore, repair, and recovery rate gets higher and it's easy to maintain a state of excitement versus a state of anxiety. Mm -hmm. It's easier to maintain a state of love versus a state of hate, rage, and anger. It's easier to maintain a state of righteousness versus self-righteous behavior. And it's easy to maintain a state of confidence versus a state of fear. You know, after listening to you, the title of your book, really makes a lot of sense now <laughs> you know uh, it's just so everybody knows if they want to dive deeper it's called free for life a u.s navy seals unique path to inner freedom and outer peace and there's so much more meaning to that title now after speaking to you for a little while yeah. this is not the conversation i was expecting by the way i was expecting a navy seal is going to come oh, okay. here and he's going to tell us how he shot his gun and went home 
and dealt with the the PTSD, the trauma, and moved on with his life. And you've gone so much deeper. Uh, the tools that yeah, the oh, tools yeah. that you've laid out here, I, f- I feel so many problems could be solved that we hear every day. And the way you've you've oh, reimagined yeah. stress at the root cause, like what's actually going on physiologically. Um, so really yeah. an amazing conversation. Uh, so where do people find the book and how do people work with you? Do you actually work with people or is this, is this? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm in Montana right now. I'm up here working with a couple. I work with people in a very deep way. That means when they work with me, I see them five days in a row, twice a day, mm. right? Because I understand what it takes to move someone into stress resolution so they can have the life that they really yeah. want. The way that people find me is simple. You go to my website, truebodyintelligence.com. Order the audio book, okay? So you can hear me. You can hear my voice. Energy is translated through the word, right? Because it creates vibration. I am not a messenger. Uh, I'm the message, meaning I've done the deep work. All the things I'm advising you to do, I've done to myself for thousands of hours. Okay. I know what works. I know what's nonsense. And if what you really want is true transformation, instantaneous permanent change, then I'm your guy. Right. But if what you want to do is fool around in life, I'm not your guy because I have a little bit of time left on the planet. I want to devote that time that I have to people who really want to be free and be happy and be joyful and be grounded and have a strong body, have a lot of energy, have grounded emotions and have a brilliant mind. Those are the people that I want to hang out with and share these tools because they do what they say and they say what they do. Yeah, And the tools that you're providing, the beauty of what you're doing it's permanent change, meaning it's kind of like teach someone how to fish, right? Because it's not, here's the yes, pill we need right. and we don't know why you need it, but it's going to make you feel good until you stop taking it. Right. It's like, I've now taught you what's and, actually going on, right? Yeah. And the fifth day is devoted to me teaching you, right? I work with you. The first day is really this really deep investigation so we can figure out what's the really, what, what's, what's the core issue? Like what happened in your childhood that caused you to create this limiting belief and this survival strategy that you keep employing, even though you know it doesn't work, right? We have to figure that out. Then we got to get into the body and dissolve all those things. And then on the fifth day, I teach you how to do it to yourself because I want you to be a self-empowered being that is no longer reliant on any other human to help you grow beyond your own limitations. Yeah. Christopher, this was an awesome conversation. Again, way more than what I was expecting. Very different than what we were, we thought we were going to talk about today. But I'm very happy that this is where we went. Uh, it's powerful. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Uh, we'll share notes on your book and your program. Anyone that wants Thank to you. speak with you further. Again, this is incredible. Thanks. Thanks.